Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Richard Skipper celebrates the best in entertainment. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Saturday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. For those of you who are here for the first time, welcome. My show is all about celebrating. It's about celebrating life. It's about celebrating art. It's about celebrating artists. It's about celebrating whatever we can find to celebrate in these crazy times that we're living in. And there's a lot to be celebrating. On November 1st, the York Theater will be celebrating Maltby and Shire. And what a celebration it's going to be. They have created some of the greatest musical reviews and shows on Broadway. Baby, uh, starting here, starting now, closer than ever, big. And they are going to be celebrated big time. And just before COVID hit the world, the Bistro Awards also celebrated them. As a matter of fact, it was one of the last events to happen just before everything shut down. And thanks to Sherry Eaker, we have a clip of Malby and Shire being feted on that very night. So we're going to take a look at them both, and then we're going to meet Malby and Shire. Here they are. Once again, thank you to the Bistro Awards. Thank you for uh, these wonderful performers who've come and helped us. There's no way to follow something as sublime as that, except with something ridiculous. We have to end this evening with a production number. And uh, this is one that's perfectly scaled for this stage. <laughs> Step in one step, sorry, and taking this one step, I won't stop with two. It was one of those days I spent in a haze. I mean, I was just moping around. And as I was moping, I happened to open a closet, and look what I found. A flat sort of ring, I fingered the thing and pressed it, and suddenly... I've never been one for flipping my lid, but I gotta tell you that flip it I did. Now, I am not the type that goes putting on hats. I'm certainly not a guy who was hot to be laughed at in white tie and spats, but suddenly clear, a voice in my ear was starting to say to me, jerk, you don't have to sing, you don't have to dance, but nothing will happen till you take a chance. I mean, I'm putting this on my head. I looked in the mirror and said, I said, mirror, if you won't tell, I promise that I won't tell. What the hell? And I took myself one step, one high step and one step, and taking this one step, 
I won't stop with now, two. Now, I know you folks are very theatrically wise. So, so I, I know this, this news won't come as the slightest surprise. But just in case you're in doubt as to whether or not or whether, this is one of those songs with two parts where both of them go together. It was one of those days I spent the whole time and I was just moping around. And as I was moping, I happened to open a closet and look what I found. A flat sort of ring. I fingered the thing and pressed it and suddenly... I've never been one for sipping my lid, but I gotta tell you that flip it I did. Now I am not the type that goes putting on hats. I'm certainly not a guy who was hot to be laughed at in white time spats. But somewhat clear, a voice in my ear was starting to say to me, Jerk, you don't have to sing, you don't have to dance, but nothing will happen till you take a chance. Oh, when did my world become splendid? Took myself one step, one high step, one step, and taking this one step, I won't stop with two. Richard and David, welcome to the show. First of all, believe it or not, that was the night before the entire world shut down. It was indeed. It was indeed. In fact, David was um, worried. David was had a cat had a car outside. He came in, got on the stage. We did our thing, and he went off the stage and into the car and left to make sure he wasn't uh, around anything. You know. Well, I, I, I felt that I have to either sing louder or play softer or have a conversation with the sound man. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you both, and you can decide who's going to go first. Uh, what did your schedules, I mean, you were getting this award. What did your schedules both look like uh, when everything shut down uh, a year and a half plus, uh, uh, you know, when the world just simply... Uh, the rug was pulled up from underneath us. Uh, what did your schedules look like at that time? Well, we, we have a lot of things coming up. We have a production of a musical based on the restoration comedy, The Country Wife. It's going to be done at Hartford. That was going to happen in the fall of that year. And it is now postponed into the fall of, of 23. Um, we have uh, a concert version of Take Flight another musical that we've done uh, that is um, was being discussed to be done in, in Vermont. And that may happen in this coming spring instead of that last spring. Um, and uh, we have uh, another show that we, we want to record. Um, we have a new review coming. We have a whole lot of things coming up. So uh, we were, we were really um, stopped. <laughs> David, do you want to add to that? Oh, um, I keep making a kind of black humor jokes about we have to outlive these projects getting on or they're going to be part of our memorial service. But we we asked the producer of one of the shows to make sure that's been delayed two or three years to make sure that the theater is wheelchair accessible. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we, this is being bookended because, like I said, uh, the night before everything shut down, uh, you were honored by the Bistro Awards and Sherry Eaker. And on November 1st, as I mentioned, you both are getting the Oscar Hammerstein Award, which is why we're here today to talk about that and everything else. Um, and I also did a little research and uh, discovered that you two I uh, have the longest collaboration of any two collaborators in the history of Broadway. Are you aware of that? Well, li still living collaborators. Because, uh, <laughs> well, Johnny, I, think, I think that Johnny, goes without saying, by definition, David. <laughs> Johnny Kander, no, John Kander and Fred Ebb started writing before we did. But uh, uh, Fred well, we died. Have, we have on Fred died. Out, outlived. 
Fred Ebb. And Harvey Fred Schmidt. Family, I mean, I must say. Ha- Harvey Schmidt died, so we're we're still alive. And as you said last week, Richard, uh, it's nice to know that Steve Sondheim, who is eight years older than us and who collaborates with himself (laughs) (laughs) and uh, and his book writer, is still uh, planning a new show. Yeah, it's it's wonderful that 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 he at ninety one is 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 working at is planning a new show so that we at our age do not seem quite so embarrassing. So. <laughs> well, I want to talk about the road that led to your collaboration, uh, Richard. You're from Wisconsin. Uh, your father was an orchestra leader. David, yeah. you're from Buffalo. Your father was a band leader. Uh, you both met at Yale University. Uh, and uh, if you can talk about how you both met, uh, first of all, and who approached who, and how did that begin? Well, David, you can take this one. Um, my next door, door doormate happened to be a guy named Doug Banker, who happened to be a close friend of Richard's from Exeter. And uh, he even was in a music, wasn't he in a musical, or wrote a musical with you at Exeter? And when he heard that I was looking for a lyricist, uh, he said, well, I know a guy who's looking for a composer. So uh, he arranged uh, a, a meeting in Freshman Commons a couple of days later, and uh, it did not go well. <laughs> it, <laughs> we, we, I, I, t- Richard thought, I, uh, I thought Richard was a, a Long Island preppy snob from Exeter, Theater snobs, a theater <laughs> snob, and he thought I was a theater know nothing from the wilds of Buffalo, and we a hit, we, which he was. We were both right, and uh, I don't know why we why we've been hey, bothered. Since- it, it, the The fact of the matter is, I came to Yale because they had a theater, and I wanted to write a musical or two. And you came from Buffalo, and you wanted to write a musical. And there was no one else who wanted to write a musical. There was right. no way we were not going to work together. There was no other alternative. Even so if we started, and wasn't it lucky that we turned it, out yes, to be like you it know? It was lucky, but it was kind of uh, uh, the gods must have smiled because I walked in into the Yale Dramat a few days later, uh, and you were, I believe, the treasurer then. And uh, I said, I have the score. Oop, I, I had a little accident the other day. It's like Dr. Strangelove. It keeps popping up. <laughs> no, don't take this personally. Person. Don't take it personally. <laughs> um, I walked into the dramat and I said, I have, this, I have the score for next year's uh, undergraduate musical. And they said, oh, let's. with 12 songs in it, uh, no lyrics, no book, no title, no <laughs> just story. 12 of my, no story, no, just a cocktail, my cocktail piano uh, wonders, uh, uh, kind of a drugstore imitations of all the music I heard my father teaching his pop piano students down downstairs from the cradle. Uh, Kern, Gershwin, Rogers, and Hammerstein, Rogers, and Hart, Arlen, the whole pantheon. Uh, and that, that should have finished me off there. <laughs> but again, as Richard said, he was, uh, we were the only game in town. So we started working together. And uh, two years later, we did our junior, we had a show called Cyrano, which had a big production. And because Richard was a treasurer of the, ba- of the Yale Dramat, it kind of bankrupted the elder man because he made sure it was lavishly produced. It was little did we know that that uh, Cyrano was set in in the period with the most elaborate costumes that ever were. I mean, uh, and it was a big production with lots and lots of costumes. What did we know? We just did it. And you know what's kind of great about college? You don't know how stupid you are, and so you do the impossible. Yeah. Five gigantic sets, probably a hundred costumes. Yeah, we just did it. And then the the kicker was that the show went for one night to the Phoenix Theater in New York, which was a pretty big deal. 
And uh, we, Richard, I guess, didn't know that you had to pay the union stagehands. <laughs> for the I, I, had, I was the treasurer. I had worked it all out and it was absolutely fine. And we would have broken even except for the fact that, you know, in, in college, you don't pay your stagehands. It's and so <laughs> they pay you. Me, we'd have to pay. The, we got this bill. I think it was for like six thousand dollars, which was. Oh, my God. Wow. So uh, we well, then the she did, a, did a nice uh, 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 modern dress play at, to open the next season and uh, it made money and we were OK again. So and then we, we did a second musical at Yale and. Uh, we had such illustrious people in our, our dramatic group. Uh, in Sierra No, uh, Dick Cavett played Ragano, the pastry chef. Don, John Cunningham played Sierra No. Carrie Nye, who later uh, married Dick Cavett, or Dick Cavett married Carrie Nye, I guess is more accurate. Uh, <laughs> uh, they, were, uh, they were in it. John, uh, J John, John, John Badham was our stage manager who became a, a prominent uh, film director for whom I scored a couple of films when in my other other half of my career. And uh, uh, Nico Sakharopoulos directed it. And uh, who else? Peter Hunt was the lady oh, Peter Hunt. who went on to, to get a Tony for directing 1776. Um, and, John Conklin, who is a world-class opera set designer. Um, it was uh, uh, Sam Waterston was on the stage mm -hmm. crew. Austin Pendleton was in it. Um, in the second musical, Gretchen Cryer and Nancy Ford were both in it. Wow. Gretchen played the lead. Um, we had some, you know, spectacular people that just happened to be around mm -hmm. um and and it was an extraordinary experience to have full two completely full produced musicals um before we even graduated from college and that really gave us a a, a start well did either mm -hmm. of those productions lead to other opportunities for you or did you have well to go directly we we a, a bunch of us decided that we wanted to do a show in new york uh, we the Fantastics had opened so that the uh, idea of doing a small musical in a small off Broadway theater was was uh, was current. We decided to do that, and um, we wrote a musical called The Sap of Life that we tried out at Williamstown and then brought into New York. Um, it was it got you know pleasant enough reviews, not not anything to send anybody to it. And it lasted six weeks, but Steve Sondheim came to see it in the second week. And then he came back a couple of nights later with Jerry Robbins. And then he came back a couple of nights after that with Leonard Bernstein. <laughs> and then a couple of nights left, he came back with um, Hal Prince. And uh, we began a reputation in New York. Uh, people began to sort of notice us. And I must say, when you listen to that album, and it's just been uh, re-released uh, I would say re-release. It's never been released. It's a it's a, a, a studio recording we just did for ourselves, but it has gone out into the um, shadow world of collectors of musicals. Um, and um, it the recording, if you listen to the music of it, the um, what David was writing in 1961, nobody was writing. I mean, it was so far advanced, mm -hmm. so far far. Uh, the steam uh, was energized, steep energized, and and uh, it was, you know, that those are the days of Julie Stein and everything. Nobody was writing the, the stuff that, it, and if you listen to that score, imagine sitting there in 1962, and um, and hearing that it's it's pretty breathtaking. Um, I asked, uh, I, I and asked the lyrics, the lyrics weren't so bad either. <laughs> well, now I'm, I was going to say, I, I sent a note to Steve Sondheim and said, what was it like to sit there? Might, that must have been what was so thrilling to sit there and hear music like that. I didn't think that the score, I thought the lyrics were sort of in and out, but sometimes they were really good and sometimes I didn't think they were. Um, and Steve said, yes, I was really, really impressed with the score, but I was also impressed by the lyrics. And then he quoted a line and I thought, Steve Sondheim has quote, can quote a line from The Sap of Life. We are officially memorable. That's, That's wonderful. That's great. Tell the line. Tell the line. 
Wild chicken. Uh, why? Why? It's a a boy running off to the big city with his with his big brother, saying, uh, "While plucking the plums out of the tree, flip a few pits back to me." <laughs> That's wonderful. It seems to mean something to Steve, and I'm perfectly happy to go with it. That that works. That's great. Hmm. Now I want to ask you: In 1968, your one of your first song ended up in a Broadway oh. review on Broadway. Um, how did that happen? Uh, was there, uh, were they looking for songs? Uh, did you, what was the connection and how? Well, uh, there was a, there, there were a series of, of New Faces musicals. Uh, the biggest one being New Faces 1952, which was mm -hmm. the big hit that, you know, introduced Eartha Kitt and Ronnie Graham and, and all of those people and, and, and had a terrific score and really funny script. Um, they were trying to match that at, with new faces of, of 1968. So everybody who wrote review numbers was presenting things. We, we were doing, we brought in a bunch of numbers for a show we were working on and they picked that one. It was a one minute number called mm -hmm. the girl of the minute. Um, and it was just a joke. Oh, you're, you're the girl of the minute and your minutes up was the, was the, <laughs> was the song. Um, and, and that, that was our Broadway debut. I cannot say that it was particularly significant, but there it was. Um, that show didn't have any great stars in it, except for Maggie Smith, who was, uh, mm. you know, who is American. Um, and she, that was like her, her, her debut. She had a small part. No one else sort of survived the show, but she was, uh, has sort of done well. I, I hear she's done well. Uh, she's done uh, quite well for herself. Um, but, you know, I want to talk about the, you know, the idea of putting a review together. Um, you're known for your reviews. Um, what is the process of formatting a show and creating an arc for a review? Uh, there is a, a magic to it. There is an alchemy to it. Uh, what is your method of putting that together? Well, could I just preface what you were going to say, which is that you should know that Richard doesn't like reviews, and our reviews were kind of a reaction to the way uh, reviews were put together, and it was due to the brilliance of Richard. Yeah, I mean, re reviews had had a uh, a compare, a, 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 mm -hmm. a, an int you know, a sort of a, a host. Who would introduce numbers and and introduce sketches, and we would always go back to them. Um, and I thought that was very boring. And um, also, uh, some people write reviews. They literally write a bunch of numbers, a ballad, a comedy number, a bunch of comedy numbers. Um, they write them to be re reviews. Um, what we were doing is basically putting together uh, our trunk. We had a whole bunch of really nice things that we that were connected to shows that hadn't succeeded or that never got on or that we wrote a special material for people. And so they were just sort of floating around. And we decided um, be, because Lynn Meadow, who we knew from the, from Yale, um, had taken over the Manhattan Theater Club and she didn't know what to do in her um, in her um, cabaret space. She said, why don't we do an evening of Maltbeinshire songs? So I thought we would do that and not have the connective tissue. And then when I, after I taught the songs to the cast, um, it came time to stage it and I didn't know where to go. Uh, I, I asked them to, it was, a, it was the song starting here, starting now. Uh, and uh, I, I, all I could do is say when they finished singing it was sing it again. I was hoping that maybe they would, I would, some idea would come up. And finally, about the eighth time that I said do it again, uh, the guy, it was a guy and two women, the guy went to one of the women and I thought, why didn't he go to the other one? And I thought, I've got a triangle. I have a story. So I put together seven songs in a row that were the story of a guy trying to have relationships with two women at the same time, hoping they wouldn't find out about each other, and they do. Um, and the songs were in, intact, but suddenly I had a book musical review uh, without any book. And uh, I, I call it the bookless book musical. And it really worked out very well. 
I didn't realize that I had sort of invented something. Uh, but the next year, uh, Lynn said, why don't you take those ideas that you were talking about, about Fats Waller and do, do one of those evenings um, with that music. And I did the same thing. And, and, you know, six months after we went into rehearsal, we were on Broadway and uh, winning everything you could win. Thank you very much. And uh, all with a bookless book musical, a musical that is held together emotionally by the things that hold a musical together um, structurally, uh, uh, except that it doesn't have the story that you think you're... When you come out of Amos Payment, you think you've seen a story. When you come out of, of, of starting here, say now or closer than ever, you feel that you have you feel the satisfaction you feel from a story. It's partly because <coughs> musicals are uh, bastard art forms anyway, and they 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 tell a story. There is the operetta kind of everything is sung version. There is also the the um, the the review form, the concert form, a, a certain kind of structure in a concert is always there. You, you do a big number, then you do a small number, and then you do. So there's a certain kind of, of, of inner dynamic and a musical fulfills all of them. While it's telling a story, it also has the same kind of dynamic that a vaudeville show has, mm -hmm. um, you know, a number, a, scene, a, a, a sort of a sketch scene, a song, and it's so so it already is a kind of of uh, of hybrid. And and I think I sort of honed it. I guess the reason that I was successful at it is that because I don't like musicals, uh, reviews, musical reviews, um, I insisted on making it having some kind of inner inner meaning. And uh, that was something that nobody ever did. And they, were, they were written as theater songs rather than it. Uh, as as review songs, so they were written for scenes that actually involved character and situation and, and part of a plot that was connected. I think you might have said this, Richard, that, that uh, we thought of closer than ever and starting here, starting now as uh, short story novels, the equivalent of short story novels, where there's some kind of relationship between the the source rather than as a collection of kind of miscellaneous comedy numbers. Yeah, the, the, I think that was the other distinctive thing because the shows, the songs had all been written for shows. They had character development. They had uh, a certain kind of, of, of depth to them that just a mere song doesn't have. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was quite astonishing in a review to have that sort of emotional pull that you get from a from a big song in a in a book musical, um, it always even though you never see that character again, you know, it always bothered me a little that Richard has his biggest Broadway hit with a uh, dead composer, uh, and I once asked him why uh, that he preferred working with live composers or dead composers, and I think he said. Well, dead composers can't criticize my lyrics. <laughs> there you go. There you are. A truer word was never spoken. Uh, well, how soon did, uh, did uh, singers and other artists start seeking you out for the work that you were doing? And was there a particular moment where you felt that you were starting to be recognized uh, for the work that you oh, were doing? Oh, very specifically, very specifically. There was... In, at the time that we were starting, there was this young singer who had just done something in called, I, I can get it for you wholesale. She had one number in that number. And she was um, causing a lot of attention in, yes. in nightclubs. She appeared down at Bonsoir and yeah. we went down. And David happened to get to know Peter Daniels, who was her musical mm -hmm. director. And, and he heard some of our songs and responded, I think, to the musicality of it and uh, presented some of them to her and she recorded them in her first recordings and that and was her first song right. was was autumn which was the first song we wrote in our collaboration which was a really good song it was from cyrano mm -hmm. so we i think that that's probably the first song from a from a college musical that went on to uh, you know any kind of uh, 
mainstream success, but that was, that was good. She, she ended up recording uh, fully uh, six of our songs. So I, I wait uh, through that musical director who directed <laughs> Sap of Life and became Barbara's accompanist. With, uh, what, he was in the pit of Funny Girl. And when he left the show after its first year, he asked me if I'd like to replace him. And I thought about one millisecond and said, absolutely. So that gave me a connection, uh, access to Barbara every intermission on, or matinee day between shows for the next year. So I took took a bunch of songs up to her one day and uh, it was a pile of that. I played one for her. She said, that's, uh, you know, that's not for me. The thing was about Barbara was, she kept changing her style like Picasso. So if you were writing a Barbara Streisand song, she was already not singing that Barbara Streisand song. She was singing what she was singing then. So she saw this song after I played her a couple on, on the piano, she said, what's that? And I said, oh, that's nothing. It just got in there by mistake. It's a, it's a review song we, uh, we wrote for uh, Robert Goulet to sing maybe in Las Vegas. Uh, it's, it's like a bossa nova. She said, well, let me hear that. I said, but it's a man song. She said, let me hear it. So I let it, and it was starting here, starting now. And uh, she she made, she kind of directed me into that arrangement, that big bill that turned it from a bossa nova into a pop Wagnerian something or other. And a, a year later, I was talking to Julie Stein, and I said, uh, uh, you know, I, I told him this story and I said, she picked it and she, she knew it was a man song before I played it. And she said, well, don't you know that's that's the secret to writing songs for Barbara? You give her man songs with without the pronouns <laughs> in the wrong place. And he says, how, how do you think funny, how do you think, uh, uh, what's the big song from? Uh, people, people. People, people got written. <laughs> But she had a very strong sense of who she was from the very beginning. She oh, told God, me yes. Down at the Bonsoir, she sat on a stool. She didn't stand. She sat on a stool. She was wearing this uh, floor-length skirt out of men's suiting material, men's tweed, tweed. And, and, a, and a, a, a satin blouse uh, that, was, that was open. Later on, that became ex extremely fashionable. No one was wearing it that at that time. Um, beautiful, beautiful nails, and she had her own cost, her own uh, clothing designer who filled the the. Uh, he was very overweight. He sort of filled the dressing room at the at the Bonsoir, this little club, and um, you know, yes, she had a she had an incredible sense of style and an incredible sense of her own uh, her own beauty, and uh, she knew how to do that, and uh, she was extraordinary in every way it, it you know the the self-confidence that she that she had there was a moment we were waiting that in the very first recording session she ever had one of the songs she recorded was autumn so david and i hustled down thinking that we'd be able to sit in the recording session we were, we were allowed to sit in the waiting room um and uh after she had recorded it she came in and they played the first mix of her recording of uh, "Lover Come Back to Me." Remember that? Oh yeah, incredibly right. flashy. Oh my God! The melody and just goes uh, over and really fast. And you know, you 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 think what incredible audacity to to just riff to leave the melody and go all over the place, and uh, how much confidence she had. We were watching when she listened to the first playback of that song. And I swear, I may be wrong, but I swear I saw on her face. Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> and from, the, you know, there was a sense of, did I go too far? Will that ever hold? Was that just mm -hmm. stupid? No. And then doing happy, do day, doing happy Days Are Here Again is a ballad. You know, no one had ever done that before. She just knew. I want to talk about Baby and how Baby came about and the amazing success that this show was. And I, I mentioned this show because Richard, 
Uh, you are in a studio right now. Uh, there's going to be a new production of Baby. Uh, in, you're giving indeed, birth yes. to Baby again. Yes, yes. Well, uh, there, there are two parts to the story. I mean, one, one was uh, the genesis of it. David was in a car driving with his brother-in-law, Francis Coppola. And uh, he was asking David what, you know, he couldn't, what, what ideas would he, what should he do to find a, a, a to, to write and find an idea for the next musical? And Francis said, well, what's the most important, what's the most emotional thing that's happened in your life? And David said, the birth of my baby, of, of my child. I was and, present. A, and a symphony orchestra went, but <laughs> um, and, and also it was the period where Broadway musicals had become kind of elephantine, you know, the big Andrew Rober, the big production, big ex expensive, but uh, overblown budget musicals. So Francis said, do something small and personal and, uh, you know, buck the trend. So I presented the idea to Richard and he didn't like it at first, just like he didn't like me at first. <laughs> well, no, it, it was that I saw no. the show as I thought it was like about the, how wonderful a baby is. In yeah, di a baby. diaper show is what's we call what's it. exciting about that. Um, but then I realized there there were a, in the seventies a whole bunch of of, uh, of movies, sort of new wave movies from England like Darling and Georgie Girl that uh, that were about oh, you can, you know, sex lives are open. You can sort of in a relationship. You can be in another relationship. You can be in and out of it. It doesn't matter. You, you know, you can have free love. It's just fine. Um, and in every one of those movies in the last 20 minutes, the heroine got pregnant. And I thought that was a joke. And then I realized, no, it's not a joke. It's like you can have any kind of sexual freedom you want, but a baby is reality. Baby stops you dead. You have to think, wait a minute. Who am I? Who am I? Who's my partner? What do I care about that person? Do mm -hmm. I, you know, suddenly a baby is reality. And as soon as it, we realized that we could tell the story about how the advent of a baby alters relationships, then we had stories. And the and baby was, doesn't co come on stage until the last minute of the show. Ah, but that's actually not true because the baby is conceived in the first second of the show. And, and even though he never appears upon, he or she never appears on stage, um, that's the main character of the show, haunting every scene that happens in the whole thing. Yeah. Um, but we wrote the show in 1983. And in, you know, now when, when uh, this wonderful company called the uh, Out of the Box um, uh, Theatrical, so it specialized in doing... Um, site-specific shows and, and, and shows that, that uh, cast uh, um, you know, disadvantaged people, uh, all sorts of diversity is just celebrate breaking all the, all the norms into as much as they can. And uh, they wanted to do it with a same-sex couple in the middle. And uh, we thought that was a really good idea, but we thought maybe it would be hard to write. And um, suddenly... We looked at the whole show and and the universe has changed utterly since 1983. Gender, sexuality, language, the, the way that you talk about relationships, um, same-sex marriage, same-sex adoption, um, uh, the age the age in which a woman could get pregnant, um, just about every element that the show touches on is um, is uh, affected by the show. And we couldn't simply um, make a few cosmetic changes. We thought, well, why not write the show we would write now? Surprisingly, the score um, remains pretty much there because the score is the emotional arc of the story. And that, that remains the same, even though the elements have all changed, even though uh, we're in a different age. The 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 emotional base, um, those turning points remain the same. So, what we are doing, um, and it will open on November fifth and play for a month here, um, is um, basically a new musical 
based on the original musical. Um, the middle, middle couple is a, a lesbian marriage. And uh, tell about the people. This is just an accident. Well, but. they it, it, it they they have cast uh, um um in in the Danny and Lizzie parts a, a a woman, great singer, wonderful actress who is legally blind, and uh, and uh, a boy, um, who is um playing playing Danny, uh, who is actually functionally deaf, virtually deaf. And both of them are kids that you would not know have any disabilities whatsoever. They are absolutely um, spot on. I, I want to say their, I, through their 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 uh, dis determination to to be uh, to to be able to function, and uh, they are so endearing in their strength. Uh, we just. Said, well, you know, why not deal with that? Because the the add to that the issue of um, genetics, uh, uh, conge you know, congenital. These are both uh, issues that are congenital. So therefore, you have to, if you want to be with your partner, are are you willing to also um, risk the fact that your child may have the same Disability, I guess. I mean, we we, we try disability. not to disability anymore. She'd be Helen Helen Keller. Well, but they're they're you know they are yeah. they are Helen Keller was the only one. Now there are a lot of very very powerful yeah. young, sure. talented um, people. Not just in not just in the arts. I mean, people in all all walks of life who are, um, you know. Um, uh, if, you know, dealing with some kind of of, uh, of issue like that, and and uh, so why not add that to the mix? Um, Julia Murney is playing the the uh, the show has a twenty year old couple, a thirty year old couple, and a forty ish year old couple, and um, she said uh, that that her her mother had had a baby when she was forty, but that was like twenty years ago. Nowadays. In, in the musical, the woman got pregnant at 43. She said, that's like nothing. What would happen if she was closer to my own age? And she asked the character to be older. Now, when have you ever met an actress in her 40s who wanted to be older? They all, they all say, can't I be 35? You know, um, and frankly, I, if Julia wanted to say she was 35, I would totally believe her. But she wanted to, she was willing to go to that and all of the emotions that are in it. Basically, we have, we are sitting there using the emotions and the, and in some cases, the story of the, that, that we got from the actors right in front of us. It's the most fun I have had in a long, long time because we were doing it. We have to do it fast. You don't have time to double think everything, which is sort of killing off musicals these days. And, um, and there is an incredible creative energy in it. And the fact that we are using everything that we can bring to the, including the personalities and lives of the, of the performers is making it an extraordinary um, experience. This is a show that if the premise of it, the baby forces you to confront the absolute most basic thing that ties you to your partner. And you have to go in in, in many ways, acting in Baby is different from almost any other musical. There's very, very few shows that ever ask you to dig as deeply into yourself and, and, and be as naked with the actual emotions that, that, that tie you to someone else as this show does. And being able to use the actual feelings of the, of the Actors is just uh, is just sort of what the theater is all about, and it's happening right in front of our eyes. And um, you know that's it's just wonderful. So, so I'm very excited, and I you know I I, I assume I will still be excited on November fifth when we start. And I will say they do amazing work. I've seen other productions that they've done. So uh, kudos to everyone involved with this. Um, I want to go back to 1983. Was this a difficult show to sell at the time? 
Pardon me? Was this a difficult show to sell at the time or? Oh my God, yes. Nobody wanted to put it on. I mean, um, you know, Jim Friedberg absolutely, you know, did a, a, a superhuman job doing it. We were scheduled to go into Broadway into production and uh, we were still $500,000 short of the budget and a, a wonderful guy named Ken, Green, Green, Ken Greenblatt came through and, and he said, you know, probably going to lose this money, but this sounds like a show I want to do. And, you know, it's people like that that make the theater a wonderful place. Um, he did, in fact, lose all his money and has never stopped saying it was one of his favorite shows ever. And uh, uh, he's happily made his back, made his money back on other shows. But uh, but that, you know, that was that was it. They didn't. I mean, I was directing it. I was then a, 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 an untried director for a, a for a book musical. I'd done Ain't Misbehaving, so I was, you know, I had a, a nice award, but um but that was, it was really hard to do that. Plus, you know, pregnancy, um, a, a woman friend of ours came up to me and said, well, I really love the show, but does it have to be so clinical? <laughs> clinical meant that we talked about fertility mm -hmm. and, and we, you know, we talked about fetuses growing and, um, she, you know, we, we, it was not polite conversation. Rem remember that she, she was in the fifties, in the fifties, you could not say, uh, uh, Lucille Ball could not say that she was pregnant. Exactly. The word pregnant was, was, uh, was uh, not allowed With child. on network television. Nor could they sleep in the same bed. <laughs> what? Nor could they sleep in the same bed. Oh yes. And they couldn't do that. Remember when those, the days, first, those days are over, right? Yes. Remember the first time Betsy Drake said virgin in a musical, in a movie? Yes. The sensation yes. it caused? caused. Yes. Well, I want to talk a little bit about collaboration. Uh, I mean, two great collaborators here. Um, the business has changed a lot since you first started working together. What are some of the things that the two of you love that about the business that has changed? And what are things that you absolutely dislike about changes in the industry since you first got started in the in the business? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a little sad that we can't hang out with Rudolf Fimmel anymore, but... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Richard. You know what I mean. Who knows from the lyrics, right? <laughs> no, uh, uh, I mean the 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 main thing is that shows take so long, and um, uh, you and know, so in the in the in the heyday, I mean, how Prince would open a musical and the next day have his production meeting for his next show, and you know, follies and a company follies. Little Night Music and uh, Sweeney Todd happened one year ap apart, and um, those you could you could not you know you're lucky if you get one show on in five years, um, and and, and, uh, and some of the steam right. goes out of it. I mean, yeah, ain't misbehaving. We went into rehearsal with a um, um, with a stack of sheet music and a good idea and the cast. And we put the show together in four weeks. Wow! And um, you know, it it played another four weeks. We m moved to Broadway, added a few more songs on the set and the band, and it opened on Broadway six months after it had opened. After we went into rehearsal for a nightclub in uh, off Broadway, that probably could never happen again. And you know, Gershwin would have two shows in the season. Because the books were really formula. It was all about going and hearing great songs. They were called musicals, were really musicals. Uh, they gradually became bookicals. Well, you know, it, if the score could be absolutely wonderful, if the book wasn't near perfect, uh, you'd get bad reviews and uh, you wouldn't run very long. 
Now, I want to talk for a moment. Uh, you are both being uh, honored with the Oscar Hammerstein Award. Uh, I want to get back to the York Theater. Um, the two of you, have you worked with the York Theater on other productions? And if you can talk a little bit about the York Theater and what it means to both of you. They're a wonderful place. A lot. They have a been lot. doing the most extraordinary uh, things for years. They have been, they are, they have, are the, the, the temple of, 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 of um, previously produced and, and, and underappreciated musicals. They do all sorts of things. We, we did a production of Closer Than Ever for them, and it was to run three weeks and it ended up running almost a year. Um, and, um, and it, 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 I mean, frankly, we got the best reviews that we have ever had for any show ever, uh, co collectively. Um, we, they did, uh, they have a series that they call their Mufti series, which is a book exactly. musicals. Um, they run about a week, but they have about a week of rehearsal. The cast carries the script. Um, and within that, those weeks, there are, you know, choreographed numbers and all sorts of, of extraordinary things. And some fantastic people do it. And they did a production of Big, uh, which allowed us to kind of relook at the show, um, uh, taking out some of the production numbers and, and concentrating on the intimate story. Mm -hmm. It had John Tartaglia from Avenue Q, Carrie Butler, and... Um, and yeah. uh, well, and then the the uh, the the guy playing the uh, the head of the toy company um, didn't show up for the first preview, and guess who had to go on? And so, <laughs> and I ended up playing ten performances. I was fabulous. Of course, you were. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, 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 was, was, it really was really good. We, we reinstalled. We really re good. A couple of songs that we that we that had been cut along the way. Um, and that's it, just had, it's just had a very successful production in London. Um, that is basically the York theater's version of it. So yeah, the York is just a great, great place. Um, their, um, adventurousness and in, and their kind of knowledge of the, uh, the history of the, of the musical theater, their ability to, to find shows. My, my daughter directed a production of, um, um, Lolita, my love, the sort of lost Alan J. Lerner version of Lolita that never came to New York, um, that opened out of town and, um, and, 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 and closed and never came in. It's a, it's a very flawed show, but it's Alan J. Lerner and there are a lot of, of very interesting things in it. And they did a very lovely production of it. Now, of course, COVID has affected the way that all of us have worked over the past year, but how do you two get together? I mean, have you worked together over uh, Zoom in terms of collaboration over the past year? Uh, what are you currently working on and what's next? Well, we have, uh, yeah, we, we have, in fact, I mean, the nice thing about, I mean, the only good part about COVID for writers is that, you know, you don't talk to anybody anyway. So, and we did discover that in fact, we could do FaceTime uh, and I didn't have to drive up to David's house to work together. Um, oh my goodness, that was, that was a great have, surprise. I, but David is frozen a little bit. A, uh, <laughs> By the way, Zoom, Zoom, Zoom has really been a boom. I mean, it's, it's really, uh, you, it, you miss something, but you gain something, which is instant access to your collaborators. Uh, we've had a number of pre-production meetings on The Country Life uh, with the producer, Joey, uh, Joey Parnes, and the director, who's the di uh, director of the Hartford stage, which is going to try out, uh, Milia Berenson. And we've all done them on Zoom because we we couldn't we were in different cities anyway, and uh, it's just great. And look, look where we are. We didn't have to fly to wherever you are. To, to well, David, this. you live right around the corner from where I live. I don't know if you know this or not. Uh, I'm within walking distance of your house. I walk every day past your house. In so, Piermont? In yes. Piermont? Oh, live, Richard's house. I live in no your house, house, David. Your house, David. Where do you live? I live on Valentine Avenue in Spark Hill. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, next time, Richard, you have to knock on the on their door. I'll knock on the door. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to thank both of you for doing this. We're actually out of time, but don't go anywhere for a moment. I just want to thank everyone for being here today. I know that I can speak for both Richard and David when I say this. Um, I don't take it for granted that you could have been anywhere else for the last hour. The fact that you chose to spend an hour with us, um, I don't take for granted. If this is your first time here, uh, please sign up for the Richard Skipper crew. Uh, sign up. My goal is to celebrate artists of all kinds, um, like Richard and David. Check out the other artists that I've celebrated here. There are over 300 episodes on this show, and hopefully there'll be 300 more. Uh, check them all out. Uh, hit the like button if you did indeed like today's show. Uh, hit the subscribe button. Uh, let your friends know about today's show, and please tell your friends. Just, uh, just, just make sure that when you invite us for your 400th show, that your that your Zoom is wheelchair accessible. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be right back here for that 400th show. Um, I don't know. Someone's trying. Uh, someone's trying to call me, but I'm going to hang up and get them out of here. So anyway, I want you all uh, to reach out. I always end every show uh, by telling everyone, I don't know where he went. Where did Richard go? I think he thought we you had dismissed him. No, I didn't uh, dismiss him. Did we lose oh. him? Where did he go? Hopefully he'll call back. Uh, did he disappear? Are we off the air? No, we're still on the air. Oh. Uh, hopefully he'll call back. Uh, I hope that he signs back on. Uh, hold on. Are you there? I hope he signs back on. We lost him. Uh, just sign back on. We lost you. Okay. Well, uh, he, uh, uh, I'll say goodbye. His computer died. David, don't go with you for, for a minute. Uh, so goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. His computer died, uh, but David, don't go where any for, where for a moment. I always end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Uh, go to your Facebook friends list, uh, reach out to the fifth name that pops up, and reach out with a phone call, not an email message, not a text message, not a private message, but a phone call, and let that person know what they mean to you. Uh, David, uh, I'm going to end the show uh, with another clip uh, from the Bistro Awards. Uh, before we sign off, is there anything uh, that you'd like to say before we close out? Uh, just thank you for this wonderful interview. It was lovely, easy, pleasurable, and I found out you're my neighbor. And uh, we're at 250 Piermont Avenue and next to Canzonas. Well, don't tell that. <laughs> next to Canzonas. Do you go to Canzonas? I do. I do. Yeah. And since we've been flooded, we're, we eat there all the time, take out food from there all the time. But let's uh, let's meet someday. Well, come over for dinner one night, you and Didi both. Okay. I'd like you to meet Didi. Well, I'd love that. Okay. I'm going to end with uh, another clip. Thank you, Sherry Eaker. Uh, for sharing this. And Desmond, thank you for getting these clips to us so we could share them today. Everyone, please go to the York Theater uh, as they celebrate David and Richard on November 1st with the Oscar Hammerstein Award. And here is the one and only, the incredible Liz Calloway. But this seems like an appropriate song to be singing. Um, um, Richard, David, thank you for this song. This 
is the tale my mother told me That tale that was much too dull to hold me And this is the surge and the rush She said would show Our story goes on Oh, I was young I forgot that things outlive me My goal was the kick that life would give me And now, like a joke Something moves to let me know Our story goes on And all these things I feel and more My mother's mother felt And hers before A chain of life begun Upon the shore of some dark sea Has reached to me And now I can see the chain Extending, my child is next in a line that has no ending. And here am I, full of life that her child will feel when I'm long gone. And thus it is, our story goes on. No!